If that's for me, I'm not here. Um, I thought I would start off by ending the unbearable suspense which has gripped this room. I will be a candidate for Congress. This is not... Can you hear me okay? This is not a decision I've come to lightly or easily. Over 40 years of political activism, including 15 years fighting the tough battles in Harrisburg, my efforts are in a lot of ways, as we've heard, paying off. I'm moving in and passing extremely important legislation, including recently bills on human trafficking, which were discussed, and reforming our criminal justice system. And I'm proud to have passed the bill, which when I first introduced it, I could not get a single co-sponsor for. But I found great people to work with. We reached across the aisle and we passed the most important piece of social legislation in the last 40 years, the medical marijuana bill. This law will save thousands of lives every year, both through the direct medicinal benefits as well as the dramatic reduction in opioid deaths we've seen in other states that have similar protocols. But this law will not only ease suffering, it will usher in a huge new industry in Pennsylvania, which will create thousands of job, jobs and brings hundreds of millions of dollars to the Pennsylvania to coffers to help Pennsylvanians live better lives. As was discussed, I've also brought my legal training into the battle for justice. I fought voter suppression efforts in the legislature, and we, when we passed the worst voter ID law in the country, I joined with other people to sue, and we got that obscene law struck down. And when the legislature passed the law that said the NRA could sue any municipality that tried in any way to keep their citizens safe, I sued, I won, and the Supreme Court unanimously struck down that law. I'm proud to be a leader in efforts to resist the current administration, Donald Trump. And yeah. More about him later. Yeah. And to be named national president of National Press of Americans for Democratic Action, the best organization in the country. Plus, Brandon and Justin, our children, are now teenagers driving and looking at colleges and beating me in sports and uh, I know that like Jen and like many of you in a similar situation I already feel the profound weight of them leaving us and going to start their own life journeys and I want to spend every moment I can with them however to weigh this against the unique situation our country finds itself in. You know, it's awkward to say this about yourself, but I've always considered myself a patriot. I've dedicated my life to politics, government, and history because I passionately believe that progressive democracy is how people should be governed. And it has been the United States of America that has best exemplified those values. But today we're a nation at risk. There are many critical issues to deal with immigration, climate change, foreign conflicts. But there are three crises that we face right now that I think go to the heart of who we are as Americans. They threaten everything that we have fought for for the past two and a half centuries. Our first crisis is economic. We are increasingly becoming a nation divided by economic station. The top 1% of Americans have 40% of this nation's wealth. The bottom four-fifths, just 7%. The average CEO used to make 50 times what their average worker made. Now they make almost 400 times what that worker makes. A minimum wage worker lives deep in poverty and has not seen their wages go up in 11 years. And the person who gets a theoretically gets tips and therefore gets the tip minimum wage, you know what that is federally now? It's $2.13 an hour and it hasn't gone up for almost a quarter of a century. Hardworking people are seeing their jobs being lost to outsourcing and innovation with no realistic options as to what to do next. Average Americans increasingly can't afford college for their kids and have to work two jobs to get by. 
The middle class in our area has shrunk from 59% 30 years ago to 39% now as more and more people fall into poverty. This isn't just happening. It is a direct result of policy choices we've made. And every one of this administration's policies designed to make these trends even worse. A society where so few flourish, while so many struggle, is unsustainable. And further, it's immoral. There are a few relatively simple things that we can do to ensure that everyone has a decent life. First, is it really consistent with the American dream for people to work full time, hard jobs, and live deep in poverty? I've introduced legislation in Harrisburg that would raise the minimum wage to a livable $15 an hour. And once and for all, eliminate the obscene tip minimum wage. And I'll fight for that in Washington. If you have a new child, or a sick relative, why shouldn't you be able to take some time to take care of your family? We are one of three industrialized countries in the world that has no form of paid family leave. Family leave was my bill in Harrisburg and I will fight for that in Washington. Why should parents agonize because they can't send their kids to college? And why should we as a society waste all of that talent and potential? It's time for America to, do, to join much of the rest of the world and create a cost-free college option for kids who want nothing more than to better themselves and serve their country. <laughs> who here likes to go to a restaurant where the chef coughs into their taco bowl? <laughs> Ants, anyone? <laughs> It's time to allow a sick person to stay home and get better without fear of losing their job. And let's create millions of jobs by investigating in our infrastructure, building badly needed roads and bridges and public transportation, and lead-free water pipes. I know, that's right, that's one of those out there things that we're still talking about. We should also enact trade policies that open markets but don't cost American jobs to countries that pay their workers slave wages. And let us acknowledge, once and for all, that health care is a human right. Yeah. It is hardly a radical proposal to say that when you get sick, you should be able to see a doctor, and you should be able to get medicine to make you better if it's available. And the only way to guarantee that that human right is something that everyone has access to is a single payer health care system that should never be taken away from you. And put patients before profits. If we do these things, create good jobs make those jobs pay, make sure you can get health care, make sure that you can educate your kids. We will make the lives of all Americans livable, and the Koch brothers will still be able to afford to go out for their birthday. <laughs> Our second crisis is political. Our founders constructed an amazing system of government, never before seen in the world. They were smart guys. Although it would have been nice if they included a couple smart women as well. But in recent years, increasingly aggressive gerrymandering, as was discussed previously, has made most of our elections non-competitive. Worse, it has made it so incumbent politicians have little political incentive to re reach across the aisle, to accomplish things, to look reasonable and moderate. Their incentive is to look rigid and uncompromising. That's no, why we can no longer work together. That's why Washington is no longer in the business of solving problems. There is no greater example of the evils of gerrymandering in this country than the district you are standing in right now. This district was drawn to, sh to ensure that your votes would never matter. When they do, drew this district to protect a Republican incumbent, they stole from you. But they didn't steal your TV or your stereo. They stole something far more precious. They stole your democracy. They stole your voice. They stole your vote. And it's time to get it back. Yeah. Our campaign
campaign finance laws, and Citizens United have made our elections about money rather than ideas or talent. And the voices of average Americans are increasingly being drowned out in a system that looks unresponsive at best and rigged at worst. Then there's this. For 200 years, politicians of both parties have resisted the temptation to use a temporary hold on power to pass laws to make that hold on power permanent. No more. The last decade has ushered in an era where there are more aggressive and extreme forms of voter suppression that are being passed into law. Voter ID, ending early voting on days where Democrats tend to vote more, moving polls, making it harder for poor people to get there, cutting the number of voting machines in certain areas to create longer lines, purging the voter rolls, goofy sham presidential commissions. We've seen it all. And I've said it before. It even more colorful language. <laughs> but I would say again to my Republican friends, if you have to stop people from voting to win elections, your ideas are bad. <laughs> See how disciplined I can get that? <laughs> Washington, I'll fight for a voter bill of rights so that everyone can vote easily and be assured that their vote will count. Because if we continue to allow our democracy to erode for the sake of partisan advantage, we soon won't have a democracy at all. Finally, our third crisis, Donald Trump. Yeah. No, they're not booing, they're saying Donald, Donald. Oh, yeah. Let me be clear. I did not vote for Mitt Romney or John McCain. I didn't like their policies, and I did not like the direction they wanted to take the country. But they were both honorable men, and they would both serve respectably as President of the United States. But Donald Trump is different. He's unlike anything we've seen before in modern American history. And I think it's important to spell out exactly what we're facing. Because sugarcoating this and pretending it doesn't exist is not going to help us solve this problem. He's aggressively hostile to the environment. He has yet to find a poison that he doesn't want to pour into our streams and into our air. Right-wing ideology has replaced science as a basis for policy. He is hell-bent on taking away life-saving health insurance from tens of millions of Americans, intent on destroying public education, demolishing our social safety net, and drastically cutting funding for medical research. He wants to cut and eliminate Meals on Wheels, the arts, funding for the Holocaust Museum. He has pretty much destroyed our European alliances and has appointed a group of people to high office whose only qualification seems to be their utter lack of qualifications yes. and their hostility to the very mission of the agency that they're supposed to head. speaking, these are his good qualities. <laughs> because even before we get to policy, we have to face the fact that in terms of temperament, character, intellect, and psychology, he has proven himself totally unfit to be president of the United States. He is a narcissist, a bully, a braggart, juvenile, and mean. He encourages violence against protesters, the press, and his political opponents. He has debased the office and made us, at the same time, both a laughing stock and a source of profound terror around the world. He attacks and legitimizes any check on his power, including a free press, independent judiciary, the rule of law, and even the concept of truth itself. He tweets obscure and bizarre conspiracy theories. And while leaders of both parties reject outright racists and bigots. Donald Trump hires them to be his top advisors. And whereas, whereas our previous president respected strong women, Donald Trump mocks them, grabs them, and makes policies affecting women without any women in the room. And so what I have done and what we all have a moral obligation to do is to make it clear every day 
this is not normal. The biggest danger we face is the normalization of this administration. Because if we become numb to what he does and who he is, we will lose our sense of outrage. And we will slowly, slowly stop resisting, and we will just accept his creeping authoritarianism. There is no law of God or nature that says that we have to be a democracy forever. We have to earn our democracy by fighting for it whenever it is threatened, and it is threatened now. Now many people get this, including many brave Republicans who have risked a great deal to say that the emperor has no clothes. Sadly, however, almost none of these brave Republicans are in Congress. <laughs> the congressional branch of the Republican Party has sold their soul. For what? A tax cut? Some Republicans contort themselves to defend the indefensible. Others agonize publicly over whether to be very concerned and do nothing, or extremely troubled and do nothing. <laughs> but the worst, the worst, are silent. They say nothing. They know that our most basic values are under attack, and they hide, hoping it all passes them by. That, my friends, is not what leadership looks like. With the stakes so high, if you are silent, you are complicit. And history will not be kind to this complicit Congress. If you elect me to Congress, if you elect me to Congress, I will not be silent. I will not be silent when Donald Trump asks why he can't arrest reporters who write stories that he doesn't like. I will not be silent when Donald Trump tweets without evidence that President Obama was sick for tapping my wires. I will not be silent when President Trump fires the FBI director to stop his investigation into crimes ranging from obstruction of justice to treason. And when Donald Trump insults and degrades women, I will think of Brennan and I will think of Jen and I will walk to the top of the Capitol Dome and stream from the top of my lungs. This is not normal, this is not acceptable, this is not America. Sometimes speaking out is all we can do. But if you're unwilling to use your platform to even do that, why are you there? <clears throat> these issues and these values are terribly important to me. The work of tending these values is all I've ever wanted to do, except for a brief period in the 70s when I wanted to be in Led Zeppelin. <laughs> well, if it wasn't for my utter lack of talent, I think I would have made it. <laughs> we named our daughter Brennan after my idol William Brennan, the liberal icon of the Supreme Court. Every time I say her name, a tiny part of me is reminded of his commitment to fairness and progress and to his love of what is best about America that so inspired me. When our son came along, I wanted to name him Marshall after Thurgood, the Lion of the Civil Rights. Jen felt we had done the Supreme Court as much as we needed to. <laughs> she said, people will think we're crazy. I said, if that's your concern, we probably should have a broader conversation. <laughs> but still, when I see Justin, that same small part of me is reminded of the grand cause of universal human equality that led me to introduce the only marriage equality bill in Pennsylvania history. <laughs> Jen's a psychologist, but I think I've embraced these values because my early life was quite difficult. I never met my father. My first de decade was filled with economic deprivation, a series of foster homes, abuse and neglect. But I survived because my community invested in me. Welfare 
food stamps, a few magical public school teachers, Pell Grants later and student loans, and college and law school, and a new life. But I never forgot where I started. And I learned we all need help sometimes. And we as a society benefit when we care about each other and provide opportunities for each other to succeed. America is about many things, but I think if I had to narrow it down to a single word, I think at its core, America is about inclusion. We don't do well unless everyone has a chance to do well. None of us are truly rich when so many are so poor. Watching our children graduate college is somehow less joyful knowing that other smart, talented kids couldn't afford to go. Enjoying my freedom is less sweet knowing that there are still others imprisoned by discrimination and bigotry. The story of America is a dignified and noble book of progress. Each chapter uh, a small step forward. The preamble to the Constitution says we're to strive to seek a more perfect union. Not a perfect union, we'll never get there, but more perfect, better, day by day, bit by bit. Sometimes the chapter, a chapter tells the story of progress deferred or progress delayed, a pause in our nation's march to a brighter future. But for the first time in an awfully long time, we now see progress being erased and reversed. And this is a threat to the whole idea of America. Our country needs us. And it's time to put away less, less pressing things. We must draw strength from our founders who risked their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors to create our democracy. Let us go from this room to help lead a movement to return this nation to what those brave founders fought so hard for. Woo! Thank you. Thank you for the standing ovation. Good to see you.